Hello everybody, it's Dr. Ray driving in on you. As you can see, it's trying to rain, um, which isn't anything abnormal this time of year for Houston. Uh, sun, rain, sun, rain, uh, pretty much how it goes. Uh, look, uh, first and foremost, before I get started, you guys know that we are raising funds uh, for the many programs and services that we offer uh, to the community. Uh, everything from our research center, uh, think tank, uh, program uh, development, program implementation, programs like Black Men Lead, uh, mental health program for men and women, domestic violence, intimate partner homicide, all of the things that we do to offer services. Uh, uh, we offer advocacy, um, for wrongful arrests, convictions. Uh, we have had our hands in doing whatever we've been contacted and asked to do. We figure it out, we connect, we do, and it's important that we um, expand our reach, to be totally honest, especially in the way of program implementation. There's so much, and as we go through this series on uh, multiple generational trauma, and how it works out. I was having a discussion on this earlier this morning. Uh, you're going to see the need for us to address this on a grand scale, on a national scale. It's playing out in every area and facet of our lives. And it makes what we are aiming to do so difficult. Uh, we need to deal with it on a uh, national level. Uh, that socialization, that's preparation and actual holistic education. If you've heard me speak on education, you know my definition for education. It is the holistic pre preparation and empowerment of young black children to grow into adults that go out into the world that's inherently hostile towards them and not only compete but win. It's, there's so much more than the attainment of academic skills. That's where we lose ourselves. We're sending our kids to institutions to gain academic skills which are then used to enrich others. We have to first educate them on who they are uh, as a collective and as individuals so that they know their value, so that they go out and they fulfill their destinies, their values. There's so much to this thing and, and all of that, but we need your support. Uh, today is going to be element of historical trauma, what uh, is often referred to as traumatic re-injury, um, in an explanation and understanding the perpetuation of generational trauma. Tomorrow we're going to talk epigenetics, but today we're going to talk re-injury. And so that we understand what re-injury means, basically, I sort of touched on this yesterday, re-injury is when you have been traumatized and in addition to that trauma, there's more trauma. It can be the same trauma, it can be a different type of trauma, but it's basically stacked trauma or what we call complex trauma, but it's re-injury. It's somebody coming along while you're already struggling with something and doing something else to you. We've had nothing but consecutive cascading events in the history of the U.S. Uh, that line up with this particular principle. We go back and we start talking about the transatlantic slave trade, and we go back and say, okay, based off of traditional history, we're not going to go into deep thought and who was here, when, and all that traditional uh, history and, and mathematics says that we were basically enslaved 246 years. Uh, from 1619 to uh, 1865. And you can get very deep and you can get very philosophical of how that looks. You can talk about slavery by another name. Uh, you should read that book, Slavery by Another Name, and we can say that in many ways we still have not experienced true liberation, true freedom, true autonomy. Some of that's on us, but a lot of it is on the systemic uh, anti-black policies. We're, and, and it's important to understand when we're discussing racism, uh, Dr. Lee Fuller Jr. once said that 
until you understand white supremacy and racism, how it works, how it impacts you, how it moves, everything you know or you think you know will only confuse you. And so we first need to understand what racism is because we often confuse racism with bigotry. Bigotry is the hatred that certain groups have for us because we're black or can have towards any other person because they are not their race or not their religion or whatever. That's bigotry. Racism is the systemic force that allows certain bigots to execute their hatred in a way that negatively impacts blacks, but it stands far beyond simple hatred. Uh, racism does not need hatred in order for it to work. Racism is a system designed as a guardian of the gate of elitism. Elitism, and what that means is it was this entire construct is initially created not to protect white people from black people, but to protect everybody from the wealthy elite. And what you do with that is you create a buffer group and give them privilege. The buffer group then uh, is told through subliminal messaging, programming, socialization, and everything else, that everybody beneath them, as the social pecking order is set up, is the enemy. They fight all the battles for the wealthy elite. Racism is the instrument, one of the most powerful instruments used for them to do so. And it's in the policies, it's in the laws, it's in the practices within corporate America, within industry, within academia, within the law enforcement and judicial systems. So that's what that is. So when we start talking about re-entry, I knew this would happen. But uh, we start talking about re-entry. We're saying, okay, we had 246 years of child slavery. It started with the transatlantic slave trade when that was outlawed. Slavery was still legal, so then slaves were simply bred like animals, like chattel. So we got 246 years. Okay, in 1865, the end of the Civil War, we are officially declared free. And it took up to two years in some places like Texas for slaves to actually find out that they were no longer slaves. Uh, but that was immediately followed by 12 years of reconstruction. And the re-injury begins. A lot of times they like to talk about reconstruction, about the rebuilding of the South. Like, you know, what reconstruction was, it was what happens on the heels of the bombing of the wild. I do apologize, but I'm gonna finish this shit. Uh, rain, it, you know, it is what it is. But I'm gonna finish this because uh, it's so it's so important. Hopefully, the, the, it's not so loud, loud that you can't hear. But I, I, I have to finish this uh, because I'm pretty sure by the time I get back in, it's gonna be too late. So the, the South. No longer as the Confederate Army, but as clandestine groups like the Ku Klux Klan and others would bomb military installations and kill people, destroy property to the point that the North withdrew. Once the North withdrew, all hell broke loose for slaves, were former slaves. Being that they were no longer of value because they were no longer property, a black life had very little meaning or value to it. And it was nothing to get lynched, killed, burned, and so much more. So now we're going through injury. There came black codes. Black codes was a set of laws that determined what jobs blacks were allowed to take. Most jobs that were skilled were not given to blacks even though they were the most skilled. But they understood that they allowed blacks to take those jobs, that they would prosper more than whites. So blacks weren't allowed to take those jobs. Uh, black clothes, black clothes also controlled and said that blacks were not allowed to own property. So then you couldn't own and build anything. Created a vagrancy problem. So what did they do? They created vagrancy laws. Made it a felon to be vagrant, to be homeless, to not have a job and not have a place to stay. There were uh, sto there are stories of former slaves literally, which is crazy, spending 12 years spending 12 years in prison 
for vagrancy. And once they were in prison, they were then leased out to the plantations they had been freed from. They were leased out to the railroad company. They were leased out to manufacturers and other corporations and they worked fields, they worked railroads, they, they did labor free of charge because the 13th Amendment made uh, uh, leeway for that. So if you got convicted of a crime, you could be held and, and you could be put to work without being paid. And so that was the exception in the, of the 13th Amendment. And we'll get into that later on in the week. But anyway, so now we've got reconstruction, black clothes, convict leasing, introduce Jim Crow segregation. Blacks aren't allowed to go anywhere whites touch, anything whites touch, visit anything whites visit, eat where whites eat, do anything. And often punishable by death just by trying to. Uh, trying to walk in and eat in a white establishment, going into a white establishment without going in through the back door. So many different things that happened. And uh, it also meant no access to a lot of the different resources necessary to build wealth. So we are constantly creating this wealth gap that was already there after slavery when we owned uh, less than 1% of the nation's total wealth. And not much has changed here in 2023. So then we come up, we get redlining. Redlining is this situation where, again, we're not allowed to buy homes in white communities because the, the presence of one black family in a white community diminished the value of the uh, community and cut off funding from banks into that community. It was called redlining. You had green, yellow, and red. And if it was circled, in, if, if that community was circled in red, no funding was hitting that, so whites became even more hostile towards blacks, especially when it came to them moving into their communities because they knew what it meant to them financially. So again, the system is creating greater hostility between whites and blacks where it actually didn't exist on a grand scale. Um, and, that, and again, this is where privilege comes in. We're going to give you certain things if they are not included. And so we start to create a stronger sense of separation. The initial separation was primarily among the elite and uh, primarily among the elite and blacks and poor. So even poor white people, I remember Chris Rock, love him or hate him, Chris Rock, uh, I think it was in Bigger and Blacker, where he sat up and said, there's not one white man in America that will trade places with me and I'm rich. And that's because of the mindset that has been created that white is simply better and there's so much access and opportunity just being white. And it's true. So with that being said, you go on, you got redlining, urban renewal, benign neglect. All of these things pull resources out of the black community and redistribute them and allow the black community to suffocate. Then you get mass incarceration. You know what that is. You get miseducation. We talked about that yesterday. Uh, and we talked about it all last week. So you've got all these things. And now you've got this big, beautiful thing called gentrification. Where they're coming into black communities, driving down uh, the value with a number of different uh, instruments and mechanisms. Then buying up all the property. Then sending the property value back up by adding certain things and building certain things to the point that the people who have lived there for years can't afford the property tax and literally lose something they own because they couldn't afford the property tax. Drive them out, move whites and other upwardly mobile non-blacks into the community. Happening around. This is called re-injury. Uh, the, the trauma of the fear of a black man knowing every time he leaves the house there's a chance he could have a, 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 a lethal and fatal run in with law enforcement and don't have to be doing anything wrong. Uh, so in essence, that's the thing that you've got to really and truly understand uh, just on the basic level of what re-injury means. And so with that being said, we really and truly have a lot of work to do. I'm about to get off of here and get in here. I do apologize for the rain, but I wanted to get this out. Hopefully, it's heard. I've done it before, and it's come out okay. Sometimes, uh, for whatever reason, there is some uh, problems with the audio, even when uh, it isn't raining. So I'm hoping that everything is working out well. 
and that you'll be able to hear this because I really think it's important that we get this series out and it's just been so busy during the day that sometimes this is the only time that I can have this conversation. Uh, but if it do, if I check it, I'm gonna upload this thing. But if I check it and it doesn't work, I'll actually redo it. But and you know, uh, hopefully I'll get some comments on here. We can ask some questions because I want to really get into a deep discussion on this. There's so much going on, and this is just barely scratching the surface. We might actually have to do two weeks on Trump. But anyway, that's that. Again, if you believe in the work we're doing, if you believe in everything that you've seen or heard me do over the past 30 years, look in the description box, you get the link, give via Cash App, via Donor Box, via the organization's website, but whatever you do, give. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day.